Coming up on Tech News Weekly, Micah Sargent and I talk about how the U.S. says China is hacking coronavirus research. Spatial is like Zoom for VR. Uh, Elon Musk has a freak out about returning Tesla's employees to work. PlayStation 5 has a demo that you really must see, and computers are creating even more pop music, and it's very convincing. That and more next on Tech News Weekly. Tech News Weekly is brought to you from LastPass Studios. Stay in control when it comes to your company's access points and authentication. LastPass makes enterprise-level security simple for your remote workforce. Check out lastpass.com slash twit to learn more. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Tech News Weekly, episode 133, recorded Thursday, May 14th, 2020. This episode of Tech News Weekly is brought to you by LastPass. Prepare for the unexpected in your business with LastPass. Trusted by over 17 million users and 61,000 businesses worldwide. Visit lastpass.com slash twit to find out how they can help you. And by IT Pro TV, dive into learning a new IT career. Get the most up-to-date training with IT Pro TV. Visit itpro.tv slash TNW for an additional 30% off all consumer subscriptions for the lifetime of your active subscription and use code TNW30 at checkout. Hello and welcome to Tech News Weekly, the show where every week we talk to and about the people making and breaking the tech news. I am Micah Sargent. And I am Jason Howell. It's good to see you, Micah. How are how, thou? How old, how, how old am I? I'm doing good. How old are you? <laughs> oh, good. I'm glad. <laughs> I'm glad. Uh, well, you know who's not doing so well right now? It's, well, it's China. Because China uh, has been accused by the United States of trying to hack coronavirus research. And now multiple groups have come out to uh, suggest that this is the case. Uh, very pleased to be joined by Laura Hautala from CNET to talk to us about this and so much more. Welcome, Laura. Thanks for having me. Yes, we are yeah. happy to have you here. Uh, so, well, I mean, let's let's get right into things. The, the first thing that uh, I think most people will wonder, okay, so we hear China is being accused of hacking uh, research what kind of research? What is it that's being that's being uh, hacked into or accused rather of being hacked into? What are they trying to gather? Right. So the and to be clear, the accusation is coming from a division of the Department of Homeland Security that is is there to warn private sector groups about hacking threats and the FBI as well. And what they're saying is, you know, uh, research related to vaccines, to treatment, to testing, that sort of thing is being sought after by hackers. And, uh, you know, they're trying to access it as well and potentially take it. Uh, and so, you know, that's really vital information that could lead to the delivery of a vaccine or medical treatment for COVID-19. Right. So is this the, the case that we know for a fact that research has been uh, sort of access or has, uh, they, that there has been attempted access and they're trying to figure out who is responsible or do we not even know for sure if there's there's hacking? It just appears that there may have been. Does that make sense? Yeah. And as always, these uh, warnings aren't always super specific. In mm -hmm. fact, I would say that this warning was meant to more raise awareness um, among the research community and tell them to use good security practices. So, you know, there's a whole long list of what is being, uh, you know, identified by hackers, what they are trying to access, what they have accessed. So it's really unclear what on that list may have already been taken. Um, but in terms of what uh, the government wants researchers to know, they said, you know, you should know that if your research gets in the news, uh, that's going to potentially make it a target for hackers. That's going to bring it to the attention mm -hmm. of people who might want to steal it. And so, you know, that's a, a point in time for heightened awareness. But anyone in the research community, the government said, can just heighten their security practices um, and make sure that it's harder for hackers to access that information. Now, that's interesting. So is part of the 
uh, recommendation to to just a- at the time when your research is published or that it gets out there in the news, then you should be doing your best to uh, protect yourself by that point? Or is it the idea that maybe you don't want to have such publicity? What What is the <laughs> exact uh, recommendation here? They did not say not to seek publicity. Um, and, you know, I think that would be pretty hard uh, ask in these times because people are so thirsty for information about what is being done to uh, potentially treat or vaccinate against this disease. So what they're telling people to do is, you know, some of the real basic things, but that are a struggle for a lot of people. So keeping all your software updated, because that makes it harder for hackers to hack. When you have your software updated, that means all those known vulnerabilities that are out there are locked down and hackers can't use them to break into your systems. Also just things like password security, Um, you know, having strong passwords and requiring things like two-factor authentication, which is when you have to, you know, use a token or enter an extra code after your password to log in. Uh, Those are the kinds of things as well as just sort of monitoring your systems to make sure somebody from an IP address really far away who doesn't really belong to your system isn't trying to access your, your data and your research. Now, you mentioned in, um, well, actually, sorry, um, the author of this first article, we're going to talk about your article up next, but Alfred Ng mentioned in his mm-hmm. article that the there's going to be more of an official kind of uh, release of some further details around kind of what's happening with these hacks in particular. Right. Do we have do we have any sense of what that that deeper level of knowledge might actually be and when we're going to find out more of this information? So the government said they'll release that information in the coming days. And typically what that looks like is um, what in the cybersecurity security community they call indicators of compromise. So they will give um, you know, file names, they will give IP addresses, they will give account names and things that are associated with the hacking groups they've identified. And that allows um, these research institutions to you to scan their networks for activity that matches up with those actors. It's just mm-hmm. kind of like these are the calling cards of the of the people who we suspect are doing this activity. Um, and so that's typically the kind of information that gets released uh, when a, a hacking campaign like this is identified by the government. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Well, it, I find it interesting as well that a lot of these encouragements are those that uh, we make regularly for everyday people, uh, the two, mm-hmm. turning on two-factor authentication, strong passwords, et cetera. Um, so hopefully if these practices are not already in place, uh, these groups will work to make that a factor. Uh, I do want to move on to talk about an article that you uh, have for CNET. Uh, Wi-Fi is a lifeline in the pandemic, and it's harder to get if you're homeless. And also charging your devices. Uh, can you talk about sort of what sparked this article and a little bit about the conversation that you had uh, regarding this this concern? Yeah. So, I mean, I was actually, I was looking at some complaints to the FTC about how hard it was uh, to deal with fraud in unemployment, which was a totally separate story. But it made me think, you know, people are having trouble calling government agencies. They really have to get information online right now. And some people are really having a hard time getting online. Um, I was talking to some librarians and they were saying, you know, typically uh, people come into the library to charge their phones if they're homeless and also access Wi-Fi. And now they can't do that because libraries are closed. Uh, so what I found was that, you know, people are having a much harder time keeping their devices charged right now. So that's problem number one. And then problem number two, of course, is just connecting to the Internet. Um, and I found there's, you know, a lot of groups out there trying to help with this situation. In uh, New York City, the libraries are leaving their Wi-Fi on so that essentially people can go outside the library um, and use the Wi-Fi there. Uh, there's an effort underway in the San Francisco Bay Area to get solar charging um, stations in place for people to charge their devices. Um, and I think it's interesting because we don't always think about people who are homeless needing or using technology, but it's very typical uh, to for somebody who's homeless to have a device. Often they don't have a data plan and they might just be using Wi-Fi to kind of use it as a tablet. Uh, but it's really vital. And I, I talked to this group in Seattle where they have um, city-sanctioned tiny house villages and Mm -hmm. they have electricity and they have Wi-Fi hotspots. And one thing they were able to do was research the stimulus check and figure out how everybody there who maybe received some kind of disability or other uh, government benefits can make sure 
that they get their stimulus checks. Uh, and they were able to do that on their own. They didn't need help from social services or anything. And so it really showed uh, as an example of how when people have access to this kind of technology, they can really take care of themselves. Wow. Yeah. Okay. This is this. I think that I, I almost want you to uh, double down on this if you can just a little bit to explain, because I think that there is certainly a, a narrative out there that uh, something like Wi-Fi connectivity or internet connectivity in some way is a bit of a luxury and charging a device is a bit of a luxury. But, and it's my understanding, sort of the argument here or the the suggestion here is that it is a necessity based on the way that folks have to be able to get help during this crisis uh, or that, frankly at any time. Is that correct? Yeah, that's absolutely correct. That's that's what I was finding um, homeless people that I spoke with as well as uh, social service workers and advocates saying. Um, I spoke to one man who doesn't really use the internet, but he does have a phone. He lives in a tent in the Bay Area and he uses his phone to keep in touch with the people who can't come out and see him anymore because of social distancing. And those are the folks that are helping him sign up for social security, helping him access his stimulus check. And those are things he needs, one, to get a portable phone charger, which is kind of his number one thing on his wish list right now after getting a senior housing apartment. Um, that's his other goal. And once he gets those payments, uh, then he might be able to get off the streets. Um, but he he really needs his phone to stay in touch with those people and you know his doctors. Yeah. Now, is there a way that uh, folks can help this this cause directly? I mean, are there groups that are uh, are you know operating to either provide internet access or provide uh, charging ability or provide mobile chargers um, that you know are specifically targeting this issue? That's a really good question. Uh, there isn't like one umbrella group that's trying to get phone chargers out to folks, but I do know that it's a, a top goal of homeless services um, everywhere I spoke with. Is, is trying to help people keep their devices running. So I would suggest getting in touch with um, your local homeless services. Uh, I think they're very much looking for assistance. Uh, one person I spoke with here said, you know, she's hoping we're at Silicon Valley's door and, and hopefully um, potential wealthy donors might be able to help out their neighbors and, and try and solve this problem. Yes. Okay. Well, uh, Laura, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. Laura Hautala, uh, if folks want to follow along with your work online, get in touch, where do they go to do so? Uh, that's a good question. I'm, I'm on Twitter at L Hautala uh, and uh, at CNET.com. You can find my work there. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. We do appreciate it. Thank you, Thanks Laura. Thanks for having me. It was a pleasure. We'll talk to you soon. All right. Uh, coming up, it's like Zoom, but in VR. And uh, the, the, I, I have a, another question for Devinder about the time, like, is the time right for VR right now where we're all social distancing? So we've got Devinder Hardwar uh, from Engadget joining us. But first, this episode of Tech News Weekly is brought to you by LastPass. Now, it's always important to have a plan for the unexpected. And LastPass can actually be deployed quickly in the midst of any event to ensure your business keeps running smoothly and every employee login is secure. Single sign-on manages employee access in a centralized view, so IT always has insights into who has access to what and from where. Enterprise password management ensures oversight of shadow IT and enforceable policies across all password-protected accounts. There's multi-factor authentication, of course, which requires additional factors to prove a user's identity, with the use of biometric and contextual factors that make the process smooth for employees. Businesses should be thinking about additional layers of defense, even beyond the password. And LastPass does not send or store your master password. If LastPass cannot access your data, well, hackers can't do it either. Encryption actually happens exclusively at the device level before syncing to LastPass for safe storage, so only users can decrypt their data. They use 256-bit AES encryption uh, that is the same encryption type utilized by banks and the military. LastPass protects while providing a seamless workflow for your employees. Account access and passwords can be shared securely between employees, whether they're in the office or they happen to be remote. Employees will get secure access to their work applications with SSO and password management, and there's an offline mode for both password management and multi-factor authentication so employees can always have access to what they need. 
Uh, we, of course, love LastPass. We use it here at Twit. Uh, I've used it on a personal level since before we adopted it as our password management solution at Twit. So I've been using it for years. I love it. I depend on it. And you should check it out yourself uh, and see see why why we love it so much. LastPass can help make remote work simple and secure. Visit lastpass.com slash twit to find out how they can help your business stay productive and secure no matter what is thrown at them. Uh, that's lastpass.com slash twit. And we thank LastPass for their support of the Twit Network and Tech News Weekly. Thank you, LastPass. Beautiful. Thank you so much, LastPass. All righty, folks. Uh, we are taking a step into augmented reality uh, in, in a time of, of us being at home. Uh, with Devendra Hardawar of Engadget. Welcome to the show. Hey, guys. Happy to be here. Great to talk with you as always. <laughs> now, are you. you coming to us from VR right now, or is this a real sort of situation we're looking at? I mean, if you want to get deep about it, um, we could very well be in the simulation. We don't know. Uh, <laughs> no, I was actually going real, to put on the headset and join this call, but no, no. I'm, I'm talking to you face-to-face -face as much as I can. <laughs> Uh, so for folks who don't know what in the world spatial IO is, what spatial is, mm -hmm. let's start there. Spatial has gone free, but yeah. what is spatial? So spatial is this company. They've basically developed a uh, virtual meeting software. We covered them two years ago when they launched and they were really aiming at businesses. They were using HoloLens uh, and supporting devices like Magic Leaps uh, to let businesses have these remote meetings you know, manipulate 3D objects, talk about uh, products that they're all developing. We're hearing from them that they have a bunch of customers within the Fortune 100 and even some top 10 companies. Uh, but the big news is that they're bringing all this tech to everybody. They're adding a web version, kind of a way for you to view these VR meetings through the web. And also they're going to be launching iPhone and Android apps too. And all of it's free for now. So they're kind of taking the Zoom approach, opening up this platform in a time when a lot of people may want to use it. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I kind of, I, I, there are a lot of different um, virtual meeting space platforms or not, I guess not a whole lot, but there, there are several different there are couple, virtual yeah. meeting space mm -hmm. platforms out there. Uh, and so I had not heard of, of this one. And I, I assume that's just because it was a commercial focused product. I think so. And, uh, you know, kind of the ones we've heard about too are like the pushes from Facebook. Uh, Facebook has had their mm. spaces and things like that. And I don't think any of those really went anywhere. We're kind of still waiting for VR communication and collaboration to really take off. Uh, mm. But I think the idea that this company, which is focused on business, company, uh, business customers up until now, kind of has a good leg in the game just because they've proven their product works. They have people who are really using it. And now by throwing it out there, um, and I tested it a bit, it seems really compelling. Uh, maybe I'm just cr a little crazy now because I haven't left home <laughs> in uh, weeks, but it is nice to like be in a virtual space with somebody and kind of talk with them. Uh, there's a video clip up there too on our site uh, that you could kind of get a sense of what our interaction was like. Uh, and it was also cool to see that, you know, I could use a web browser as a window into this VR world too. So they're kind of bringing more people in and that's a big oh. thing. Uh, VR has been kind of restrictive up until now. Like if you didn't have a headset, you couldn't really use any of these services. This is actually a really smart way to bring more people in. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that makes mm -hmm. sense. Now, what are the kinds of things that you can do in this virtual collaboration space? I mean, is it is it tailored to work entirely or is there fun that can be had? I mean, I've seen, <laughs> I've seen some interesting things happening in here. There's a horse. Right now, I really do think they're, they're focused on work. There's no like entertainment or game stuff that you could do. Um, the big changes they've made now is onboarding. So they're teaching people how to use this platform. You kind of have a menu around your waist when you look down from VR, which can let you bring in objects or draw on the screen or draw on objects, manipulate things. So it's really all about bringing in objects, bringing in like screens. You can have a giant screen that everyone's looking at too. And just focusing on these things and collaborating on them. Uh, one really cool thing we were able to do, I, I was standing in kind of a life-size version 
of a cell phone store and the CEO and the chief product officer from Spatial were just walking around and showing me like, oh, you could maybe move the, um, you know, what you want the phone display to look like, what you want the science to look like. Uh, walk around that as if it was a real world space, which could be really useful for companies as they're designing stores. Uh, and then they were able to shrink that down completely. And we looked at it from above, like towering virtual reality gods. And that just kind of showed the power of this whole thing. Like you could go from many different ways of interfacing with a single object or even something like a room. Hmm, that's fascinating. Mm -hmm. Now, OK, yeah. so as we as we've mentioned, you know, in the last couple of minutes right now with with everyone working from home, suddenly video conferencing is like the technology that everybody's racing to do. Everybody, you know, sure. and anybody like Google opened up Google Meet, which was prior, you know, a paid for product. Now they're like, oh, wait a minute. We have the ability <laughs> to capitalize off the fact that people need these services sure. now. Maybe we can become the major player here. Do yeah. you envision maybe they shouldn't have killed our, Hangouts when they did? Well, like that was part okay. of it. <laughs> all right. All right. Fair. They're always trying to undo their previous mistakes. That's just the Google way. But um, do you think that now is the time is right for a VR focused uh, solution like this? You know, you know, in a moment <laughs> where we can't meet face to face, this is this is a good alternative to give us what maybe we uh, get us closer to what we were used to. At the same time, it's a heavy lift, right? Like you got to be okay with the fact sure. that you're strapping a VR goggle on your face in order to <laughs> attend a meeting. That might be just too much for people. Is now the right time for this? I feel like it's a good time to experiment with it just because in the past, like when you could just go to an office or something or meet somebody face to face, I think most people would prefer doing that. But right now we have this pressure to kind of be home and stay isolated to, you know, not catch a virus that's everywhere. So yeah. I think with this pressure on us, there's definitely more of a reason to explore VR. Um, especially something like the Oculus Quest, which is not that expensive. It's 400 bucks, but self-contained. It doesn't need a PC. It's completely wireless. It's easier for companies to deploy things like this. Um, maybe we'll see more adopting these meeting rooms. Um, I think the time certainly is now. And hey, Half-Life Alex just came out, and that was like the killer game you know, we've been waiting for in VR. So if not now, I'm not sure when is going to be a great time for VR because it does feel like you're somewhere else. I did feel like I was in another space. I wasn't just here in my home office where I've been stuck for a while. And it felt like I was being transported somewhere else. So there's value to that, certainly, when we're trapped and even when we're not. Like, if I want to meet with somebody on the other side of the world, maybe I want something more than a video chat. Because to me, it's always a little... Uh, it's a little passive. It's not as interactive and it doesn't feel as like I'm standing next to somebody as you would in VR. Yeah. Now, one of the, the selling points, the, uh, I don't know, benefits of using Zoom, I guess, is the simplicity. I can send a link uh, to a person sure. and you don't have to download a, an app or anything like that if they don't want to. It just goes. Uh, do, yeah, exactly. Does spatial, I, you mentioned that you can join via the browser. How much work was yep. involved in joining that way? I know that there's more work involved if you're doing the headset, but is it easy to join spatial just as easy as Zoom? Yeah. Uh, so they sent me a link and I clicked in my browser and boom, I was in. So it was very simple like Zoom. And what's really interesting too is that I'm seeing like a rendered view of the virtual world. It's actually being rendered on my computer or my browser. They're actually doing that in the cloud, similar to the way that game streaming works. So that means they can bring this sort of 3D world down to machines like Chromebooks or things that are kind of underpowered. That's kind of a smart decision too. So getting in there, was super easy. Uh, I was able to use my webcam. I appeared like, uh, you know, like, uh, what's that? The, the guy from Power Rangers, Zordon. I was just like <laughs> Zordon up there while they're in the room. And you can look up and see the person the webcam and all you can do is peer down, but it's still, you can still be a part of everything that's happening. Hmm. This is this is fascinating. Now, other than spatial and, and uh, Facebook, I mean, do we think that that I, I wonder, do you think VR is still looking for its sort of uh, killer app, oh, yeah. its killer experience? Have we not found that yet? Or is this kind of thing, mm -hmm. the meeting, virtual meeting space, the answer to getting more people into VR? I think it's going to be one of many things. We're still waiting for those great experiences. I think Google Earth, like Google Earth on its own, is an amazing thing to experience in VR. The problem is you have to experience it. You know, I can't just, it's like me describing um, a great work of art or something. There's a difference between 
hearing about it and experiencing it for yourself. And VR is such a very different thing. If you've never put on a headset, you don't know what it's like to completely block out the world and see a, com a totally different reality or totally different environment. So I think VR still has a lot of things to work through. They need more apps for sure. Uh, but I like more, we want to see more devices like the Quest, which are not that expensive. They can certainly get cheaper, um, but that are easy to use. The cool thing about the Quest is I could just put it on. Um, I could sit here and just start doing stuff in VR. I don't have to set up sensors. I don't have to like create any maps around my room. And I need it if I do... If I want to walk around, I may have to do that. So even that's not super convenient. It's really convenience. I think that's the, the key with tech. Until this stuff is easy, Zoom is easy. That's why a ton of people are just using it now. Um, we got to fix that convenience factor for VR, and maybe then it'll go somewhere. Yeah, Zoom is easy. Literally open up your laptop and yep. go. Uh, yep. VR is still like, even, even not having the cameras in the room and all that sort of stuff with an Oculus, you, yeah. you still you have, have the... It. the yeah. yeah, you had to put it on. I mean, it is a big cumbersome thing that you're attaching to your face. However, we have yep. the kind of like uh, the news leaks, rumors, whatever about the upcoming revision to the Oculus Quest that maybe it might have some sort of AR hooks in it as well. Mm -hmm. Could that be the answer? I mean, the 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 timeless question, or at least the last five years with yeah. with AR and VR, is which one's going to win? Which I'm not necessarily certain that one has to win over the other, but maybe yeah, that they're, they're takes both very, this to the next yeah, level. Yeah, different things. Mm -hmm. um, Do you think this maybe that, something that like could that? Happen? I haven't seen that leak, to be honest, uh, but we have looked at devices like N-Reels, and that's something we saw at CES, I think, a year or two ago, and those basically look like shades. You know, they're shades that project augmented reality uh, objects in front of you, similar to Magic Leap. So I do think we're going to get to a point where something like that is easy. You slip it on. Maybe you still have to charge it for sure, but it's going to be easier to use, and I'm waiting for that magical device that is both AR you know, transparent when I need it and also can block out the world and be VR too. Uh, it's not about one or the other kind of winning. It's more about different ways of portraying virtual worlds. Got it. Yeah. And I should, I should clarify uh, the AR headset is actually a different Oculus headset. So uh, they're working on yes, an yes, Oculus yes, Quest yes. revision. Yep. They're also working on it, uh, supposedly an AR headset that's due in 2023. I so imagine everybody still is. a ways like, away. Yeah, there's the rumor. Yeah. There's the rumor Apple is as well. So yeah, we're right. going to see some cool stuff in the next few years for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, as you continue to keep an eye on that cool stuff that'll be out, uh, where can folks follow you online so they can make sure to stay up to date? Sure. You can find me on Twitter at, at Devendra. I write about tech and gadget. And I also podcast about movies and TV at the Slash Filmcast at SlashFilm.com. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Devendra Hardawar, for joining us today. We do appreciate it. Thank you, Devendra. Thanks, guys. We'll All righty, folks. Up next, Elon Musk says, please arrest me. But first, this episode of Tech News Weekly is brought to you by IT Pro TV. If you've been looking to invest in yourself and your future, there has never been a better time to educate yourself with IT Pro TV. There's plenty of uncertainty in the world right now, but IT Pro TV will help teach you skills to become an IT professional, a career that is nearly recession proof. At itpro.tv slash TNW, you can sign up for the remote learning opportunities it offers. IT Pro TV helps you learn the skills to become a developer, a network admin, a sysadmin, and more. IT Pro TV always has the most up-to-date content. This is vital with a constantly changing IT world. It will always have content that is current, relevant, and up-to-date. Are you the head of a team looking to develop your team's skills? Well, IT Pro TV offers corporate standard, corporate premium, and corporate enterprise plans to fit your business size. IT Pro TV offers more than 4,000 hours of IT training, as well as being the official video training partner for CompTIA and having 12 CompTIA on demand courses, including CompTIA A, Network Plus, and Security Plus certifications. If you're about to cancel your next conference, don't. IT Pro TV will deliver and facilitate your next virtual conference. In fact, they'll take your conference online with general sessions and breakout sessions, and they can do it with speakers live in studio or remote. Get the skills you need to be an IT professional or set your team up for success. You just go to itpro.tv slash TNW and use the code TNW30 to receive 30% off all consumer subscriptions. That's itpro.tv slash TNW and use the code TNW30 for an additional 30% off for the lifetime of your active subscription. IT Pro TV, build or expand your IT career and enjoy the journey. 
Thank you, IT Pro TV. We appreciate you. All right. The pandemic and related closure of non-essential businesses is, of course, uh, causing havoc for, for all types of, of uh, businesses looking to keep the lights on. One such company is Elon Musk's Tesla. Late last week, Musk tweeted out uh, that the company would be filing a lawsuit against Alameda County, where its Fremont, California plant is located. And that was followed by a threat to leave the state altogether. At this point, I'm not entirely sure whether it's a threat or whether it's actually going to happen. But someone who might have some further details on that is joining us right now, Sam Abu El Samid, principal analyst at Guidehouse Insights and host of the Will Bearings podcast. Welcome back to the show, Sam. Hey, Jason and Micah, how are you guys doing today? Doing, doing well. awesome. That's a that's a swell ride behind you, by the way. <laughs> that's uh, that's an original Tesla Roadster. Oh, oh okay. Clever. I had a chance to uh, do a test drive of it. Uh, did a uh, first drive review of it for Autoblog back in January of 2008. And that is a collector's item. If one has has one of those uh, sitting in their garage at this point, or is it? It, it still certainly too early? is. Yeah, they only built about 2,200 of them. Okay. Okay. All right. Then absolutely. <laughs> Uh, well, Sam, it's good to get you back. Um, let's talk a little bit about Elon Musk. I know you enjoy talking about Elon Musk. We've heard <laughs> we've heard your views on Tesla and Elon uh, many a times in the past on the show. Um, at, at up to this point, at least in you know in light of everything that's happening with the pandemic and everything, Musk has been pretty outspoken in criticizing the shelter in place. Uh, orders. What what exactly is his perspective there? Is it purely business oriented? Like like this is going to hurt businesses and that's unnecessary? Is that the kind of the arc of his viewpoint? You know, it, it's always hard to tell for sure what Elon's rationale is with anything that he says. Um, you know, he'll he'll often say outrageous things and then come back later and say, oh, I was just kidding. But I mean, he's been pretty consistent throughout the last several months, uh, throughout the, the period of the pandemic of you know, downplaying it, you know, basically following the same um, the same line of thinking as as Donald Trump, uh, you know, saying that it's it's not really very serious. You know, he at, at one point back in uh, late February, early March, he said by the end of April, we'll have no more cases in the U.S. You know, he said it was no worse than the flu, said that children were essentially immune to it, all of which was blatantly not true. Um, and so, you know, right now what's going on, you know, with these threats, you know, I think, I think a big part of it was he absolutely did not want to shut down the factory. He, he's absolutely, um, it's essential for Tesla that they keep that factory running, churning out cars that they can sell to generate revenue because, you know, they, you know, if they shut down, you know, their revenue drops to zero. And which is the same thing that every other car maker, every other major manufacturer has, has had a problem with over the last couple of months. So I think he really w needed to keep the keep the the cash flow going. Yeah, I mean that's what anyone who who owns a business right now that's one of the things they're concerned with. Of course, uh, many business owners are also concerned with people's health and ability to stay alive and the people that they love and all that kind of stuff. So it is a complicated situation, uh, no doubt about it. Now, he issued a threat to sue on Twitter. That was followed by a tweet where he stated that production would resume on Monday. He even said, if anyone is arrested, uh, I ask that it only be me. So really putting his money where his mouth is saying, I kind of don't care. We're starting up production and you can talk to me if you don't like it. Um, effectively, this is just a bargaining chip, though, because it kind of seems like that tactic has worked for him, right? Um, yeah, well, you know, for what it's worth, they actually did file a lawsuit against Alameda County uh, on Thurs Thursday night, Friday night. Uh, well, anyway, sometime late last week, they did uh, within a couple of hours after he posted that tweet, they actually did file a lawsuit um, okay. claiming that uh, the county was violating the company's constitutional rights and freedom of movement and all this sort of stuff. So, yeah, there you see it there. Um, and, you know, it's it's not, you know, the, the threat to move out of California is not totally without merit. I mean, he actually could do that, um, you know, within, you know, he they have. Tesla has operations. They've got the Gigafactory where they build batteries um, in Nevada near Reno. Um, and Tesla, or rather uh, one of Elon's other companies, SpaceX, has a big operation in Texas now, uh, in Boca Chica, Texas, in South Texas, where they're uh, trying to build the prototypes of their next generation rocket and test those. Um, so it's not inconceivable that Tesla could 
uh, relocate out of California, uh, at least its its headquarters operations. Moving the factory would be more problematic. You know, they could they could move the 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 headquarters from Palo Alto somewhere else, on a relatively quick timeline. Uh, mm-hmm. Moving manufacturing somewhere else would take a lot longer. It's probably at least um, a 12 to 24 month timeline to do that. You know, because they would have to basically take take all the equipment out of their factory. They'd have to have a new building set up somewhere else. They could do that in in Reno. Uh, where the Gigafactory is, they actually have a lot of space there, uh, and they could uh, they could put up another building there and and move their equipment there. But there would be a significant disruption in production while doing that, which you know is what what Elon's clearly trying to avoid with all of this fight back against the uh, against against the the shelter in place orders. You know, and at the beginning of this, you know, they they tried to claim. That you know, car manufacturing was an essential business. You know, they tried to use that as a loophole to avoid closing down. But clearly, you know, it's not. It's not essential. Um, you know, it's not. It's not something that um, needs to happen. You know, like food distribution and production. You know, those are essential businesses. Building high-end performance cars is not an essential business in this kind of situation. And you know, they they shut that down pretty quickly. But um, so they, they could conceivably move uh, somewhere else. And, and that wouldn't necessarily be a matter of, bu- of building a new factory. It would be taking a factory that they already have and moving it over still well, a long time. They, to make they, that would, they would have to build at least a new building. Um, you know, they don't I don't think they have space within the existing building that they have in Reno uh, to install all their assembly lines and everything and, and do that. So they would have to put up a new building. Uh, but they could move the existing equipment, uh, and they have plenty of land. They have they have more than enough land uh, in Reno. That facility is only about the third, uh, one third the size of what was originally planned, and so they have plenty of space to do it. They just they but they do have to put up some walls and a roof. Yeah, right, right. Now, um, bringing the employees back, you know, as as happened earlier this week. What kind of protections uh, are those employees uh, are given through through Tesla? Are they are they like how are they employing these these rules of social distancing and and how making the employees feel like they're returning to work and maybe they don't necessarily want to t- return to work. Maybe they side with the with the government and say, hey, I want to be safe. Are they being protected at least in some way while they're there? Yeah, this is something we don't know. Uh, Tesla has not given any details, and in fact, some of the stuff I've seen, uh, you know, that was issued by uh, Alameda County uh, Health Department the other day when they said that they were going to allow Tesla to go back uh, and start production again. They, you know, they were saying that you know Tesla has a plan to have a plan, uh, which whatever that means. <laughs> uh, you know, so we we Love don't that. know what they're doing. You know, whether they're issuing face masks or whether they've rearranged the assembly lines. You know, other car makers like Ford and General Motors and Honda and others. You know, they have they have actually published what their plans are, what they're doing. Uh, you know, uh, most of them you know have made changes in their in their workstations on the assembly lines to move people further apart. They are definitely giving. Um, Masks to everybody. Uh, in the case of uh, Ford, they're also giving them giving uh, people, depending on the job, they're giving them face shields. Uh, and Ford is also issuing uh, Bluetooth wristbands that were they got from uh, Samsung to all the workers on the assembly line uh, that will buzz. It'll buzz your wrist anytime you get within six feet of another person. Uh, so they're not tracking where people are, but they're just using that to alert people that hey, you're too close to somebody else. Uh, my guess is that Tesla is not doing much of that. Uh, Tesla has a long history of uh, workplace safety violations. They've been cited many times by the Occupational Health and Safety Administration for safety violations. Um, they've got they tend to have a lot more injuries in their factories, even under the best of times. So we don't have any idea what Tesla is actually going to do. Hmm. Yeah, and just just now you you alluded to um, there was a there was a medium post by Don Conroy, director of operations with Ford, uh, who posted about their kind of efforts that you were you were talking about a little bit of kind of returning to work. They've they've created what they call a return to work playbook. It involves a close collaboration with its partner Argo AI. What does that collaboration look like? 
Yeah. So this this part is, um, you know, they're starting up the factories again uh, next Monday. Uh, but uh, this particular post and also a related posting on the Argo AI website is about how they're uh, getting ready to get back to testing their automated vehicles back on the road again. You know, for the last couple of months, they've been relying on simulation testing, doing a lot of simulation work, but they haven't been doing any road testing of their vehicles. And so they've been putting together a plan, you know, working with the, the same teams that are preparing the factories to go back to work. Um, you know, following all the CDC guidelines. So uh, in the vehicles that Argo tests, um, what they've done is they've installed plastic barriers um, in between the, the, the right and left side of the vehicle um, to keep, because each vehicle has two safety operators inside, one whose job is to keep their hands by the wheel and be ready to take over if necessary when they're testing the autonomous system. And the, the other one is monitoring the data um, and checking what the sensors are seeing and everything. And so they want to keep those people separated. So everybody's getting masks. They're also getting those wristbands, um, installing plastic barriers. Uh, they've installed HEPA filters in the uh, the climate control system of all the test vehicles and also put, you know, that's for the incoming air through the air conditioning or heating system. Uh, but they've also installed five stage um, air filtration systems on in the in each of the vehicles on either side of the barrier that um, filter the in cabin air. So they're going through HEPA filters, um, UV um, ionization filters, um, and a couple of other things uh, to try to keep the air inside the, the vehicle as clean as possible. Um, and then also they've made changes in the way they're doing things at their at their terminals you know where the when the vehicles come in after a shift they've they're staggering the shifts they used to have the t the the day and afternoon shifts overlap um, in the middle of the day, they, they would come in at the same time and they would have a daily all hands meeting uh, to go over what's what's going on and the safety updates, things like that. They've now separated those two. So they're limiting the number of people that come into the garage, into the test facilities every day. Um, and uh, they've changed the workspace around. They're doing a deep cleaning on every vehicle when it comes in uh, after, after a drive shift. So they're doing a lot of things to try to um, uh, keep everybody as safe as possible. Uh, and uh, the other thing, uh, another company that's also doing testing of AVs is NVIDIA, the, the same company that makes all those fancy GPUs. They, they make chips that are used by a lot of the AV companies in their vehicles, and they do some testing of their own, you know, of their hardware and their software. And uh, they just today announced uh, as part of uh, Jensen Wang's uh, keynote, uh, their CEO, uh, for their virtual GTC. Um, they announced a, a new software component for their stack called uh, Drive RC for remote control. And they originally developed this for doing teleoperation. So if, if somebody, if a remote operator needs to take control of an autom autonomous vehicle, um, if the vehicle doesn't know what to do, um, they can see, you know, they can stream the data from the sensors and they can see it and control the vehicle. Um, but what uh, NVIDIA is actually using this for internally is to allow social distancing between their two safety operators. So now instead of having two people in the vehicle, they have one. Um, whose job is just to watch the vehicle. And then the, the person who would normally sit in the, the right-hand seat watching the data is actually sitting at home and getting a live stream of that data in real time so they can monitor everything remotely. Hmm. Fascinating. And and that last story that you were mentioning, the NVIDIA story, you, you did write about this. Uh, everybody should definitely check out your article at Forbes.com. Uh, Look for NVIDIA cranks up and turns down its drive AGX Orin uh, computers. Uh, Sam, we can always depend on you uh, to give us the scoop on what's going on in uh, in the automotive industry, one, but the, the technology side of automotive. And we really appreciate you taking time to join us. Um, where do you want people to follow your work online? Is that the Will Bearings podcast? Uh, you can follow my podcast at Wheel Bearings. You can see stuff that I write at uh, Forbes uh, and the, the work I do for my day job, uh, which is as an analyst uh, leading e-mobility research for Guidehouse Insights. You can find that at guidehouseinsights.com and find all of our research reports and the blogs that we write there uh, on that site. Right on, Sam. Thank you for taking time, man. We'll talk Always to you Always happy to talk to you and Micah. All right. Thanks appreciate it. Talk to you soon. 
All right, story of the week time. All righty, it's time for the story of the week. So uh, today I am talking about Epic Games with the epic launch of the epic Unreal Engine 5. Listen, I'm trying to Is it epic or is it Unreal? It's both (laughs) epic and Unreal. Uh, As a person who doesn't game, really... This is is simply a, a a matter of just being absolutely fascinated by the technology involved in creating this new uh, engine, this new gaming engine. It is incredible detail, incredible uh, movement, incredible. I mean, it's pretty wild. It's pretty doggone wild. And this is uh, UE5, uh, which is the Unreal Engine 5, is going to be able to run on the Xbox Series X, or is it Xbox Series 10? I don't know. And maybe it's the 10 box Series X and Sony's <laughs> next PlayStation, the PlayStation 5. Uh, this, I don't know. I, I, what else to say besides this looks like such a jump in gaming quality in the the graphics quality and the renders that are included in this verge article they look like they're real they look like real life it's ridiculous i want to be in this ancient ruin that they are showing in this game uh it's oh man i'm just really impressed i don't know you i i sent you a link about it and you had even messaged me to say it looks ridiculous. It's so good. <laughs> oh, I mean, it's breathtaking when you watch this and make sure when you go to YouTube to, you know, make sure that you're streaming in 4K so you get all of that 4K goodness. Mm-hmm. The quality, like the facial um, movements, the features of the woman that's featured uh, in the demo when she's talking. Like, I'm so used to seeing these virtual characters like, yeah, their lips line up with the t- with the dialogue, but there's just su- there's still a disconnect here. And mind you, we're also firmly in the 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 position at this point that we usually are when like a new console comes along where we're our, we're not adjusted to this new level of technology, this mm-hmm. new quality. So it looks like holy cow, we've never seen this before. I'm sure in a few years, maybe our expectations or our, our judgment will kind of catch up with us a little bit and we'll start to find the flaws. But right now, like, I mean, the the dialogue aspect and how that matched up with the, with the character's face and everything looks crazy real. All the detail in the in the cave and the rocks and little like pebbles floating down and how the light is cast and in different how they can play with with the the light bouncing off of objects and it's just a really remarkable demo. And uh, they you know they they talk about the process inside there and a lot of it is you know game developers speak that I don't necessarily yes. fully comprehend. All but over my head, yeah. The idea of filling these scenes with hundreds of millions, if not billions of polygons and triangles in order to make up this, this textured landscape that looks real. Like to my eyes, it looks very real. And then to understand that that's all being rendered from what I understand, rendered in real time, that the idea is that this would be gameplay footage. Uh, it's, it gives me a lot to look forward to. It gives everyone a lot to look forward to. And we'll be really curious to see how much this damn console costs when it comes out. Cause <laughs> it's, it's pushing some pretty, um, pretty like advanced technology under the hood. Yeah. It'll be great when those two, when, when that technology can combine with virtual reality. So you get VR in this level of detail, and then we'll be literally transported to a new universe and I can't wait well, for it. You might not have to wait very long because, I mean, from what I understand, the PlayStation 5 will have uh, a VR component. I I don't know if that's confirmed, but I'm pretty sure I've seen news pointing to that being the case. Um, So, I mean, in essence, to be getting the graphical capabilities of it. And I don't know if there's a, a scaling down that has to happen because... Um, producing VR, you know, VR, you know, and the fact that you can move around in, in any in any direction and you have to re-render all that stuff. I don't know if that that puts a hit on what you would see if you were just rendering for the display itself versus like a VR environment. Maybe that has to scale, but I have to guess that you get a lot of these improvements in VR. Then it just becomes how high res. And this is this is the hill that I will always die on when it comes to <laughs> VR. It's, is that I want a display in VR that is as sharp as as the naked eye is in the real world. And I yes. feel like that's that's something that we are not 
close to yet. But the closer we get there, coupled with just the capability of these chips and these developers to create experiences that mimic and look so closely to the real world, then, yeah, you're getting to a point at that point where VR is truly transformative. And I don't know if the PS5 is going to be that, but it'll be one step closer. And I'm really looking forward to it. Yep, same, same. Yeah, um, so can't wait. Happens. Yep. Uh, uh, let's you let's put go that ahead and move there. on. It was it was eye candy, and everybody should definitely check it out. And then check out this ear candy, which I ah, love stories nice. like this. I've talked about this on the show many, many times. How how AI is influencing music and creativity and this sort of stuff. Uh, open AI researchers have devised a system called Jukebox that creates original uh, songs from scratch. And, you know, it's it's done in a similar way that w to what we're used to. It's the same technology behind deep fakes. You know, it's really all, all about training the algorithm with a large data set and then letting the algorithm go, go wild and the, the system go wild and creating something based on that data set. It's an open uh, source algorithm. They trained this using 1.2 million music samples from real artists across all genres. And essentially how it works is you feed it a genre. So you say rock in the style of uh, queen. Uh, and then you give it a small sample of some lyrics. And then it uses that information and the 1.2 million music samples that it, that have been fed into it to create an all new song <laughs> that wow. basically sounds like, like it could be, have been created by a human. And we're talking drums, uh, guitars, keyboards, lyrics, vocals, solos, all this stuff. The things that it's not very good at yet are certain musical structures. So like the idea of like a repeating chorus, how a chorus happens and then you go verse and then it comes back to the chorus. Not quite there yet. Have to imagine they'll get there eventually. But John, um, I implore you to basically pick anything on this page and play the, play the audio from it because any one of these, you, you listen to it and it's not quite perfect. Like you're listening to it, it's kind of a little off, but it's crazy that a computer just kind of created this out of thin air. Uh, based on this algorithm, and I'm curious which one you're picking. Let's see here. Oh. Come on, get to it. This is Celine Dion. <laughs> so this is Celine Dion. Okay, playing. I can't wait uh, to go play with this. Yeah, so this is obviously in the style of Celine Dion, this is pop music sample. They've got like hip hop in the style of pop, and it's crazy. Oh my goodness, Celine, a, a Celine Dion song that she never sang or wrote. That's wild. Isn't that weird? <laughs> Oh, that's, that's kind, of, really... kind of blows your mind. So then we end up in this weird world of like, okay, so what happens then when a computer, a computer algorithm creates a song that sounds so similar to a real artist that the artist decides, hey, I don't want that. I want to sue or get that removed or whatever. What are the rights and everything that come into yeah. play in a legal battle when you're talking about that? Is this sampling I don't know because it was created by a computer, but it was based on a training set that involved real music. I don't know. It's it's a weird world that we live in. Interesting. Yeah. That. <laughs> yeah. I mean, who's as because this reminds me of that. Now it's a little bit different, of course, but it reminds me of that. Uh, there was an ape that took a photo. Uh, I should say a primate that took a photo of itself with a camera. Yeah. And then that photo ended up going, you know, I think it was printed in a magazine and the person who owned the photo, who owned the camera said, you know, that photo is mine essentially. But then there was an argument that the photo belonged to the ape that belonged to the primate. Right. And of course, a primate is a living, breathing creature. But does this, there it is, there's the monkey selfie uh, and the monkey's representatives are going to sue us oh. uh, now. No, I'm kidding. And so it makes me wonder, you know, does this apply to an AI? Maybe not at this point, but in the future when we have her style AI, uh, who knows? Ooh, I mean, I mean, imagine this technology being developed further for the next couple of years and suddenly you create a song that sounds indecipherable from Celine Dion. Like literally it's Celine Dion's voice. 
It's, you know, the lyrics are spot on, uh, the music is spot on, but she never had anything to do with it. And this, this gets us closer to there, but when you really listen to it, it's kind of like, I think those are real lyrics. I can't really quite tell. And some of the other, uh, songs that are represented, there's like some dissonance between the instruments. So you can tell kind of, it, it feels like a patchwork versus like an actual cohesive song. But, but again, with all this technology, we're the, we're here now. So think about where we'll be five years from now when this is developed further and the systems get better and all this kind of stuff. And yeah, it's going to be a really interesting kind of uh, legal conundrum that we'll find ourselves in. I'm suing you, computer. <laughs> computer, I am suing you. <laughs> I'm taking you oh, to court, boy. computer. And who knows, wow. maybe, maybe computers will be able to defend themselves in, uh, in court, probably. Yeah. Yeah. All right, well, so that's the story that's of the that. week from... From my perspective. And that is it for Tech News Weekly for this episode. Uh, we publish this show every Thursday at twit.tv slash live. That is the show page on the web that you can go to find all the ways to subscribe in audio and video formats, or you can link out to YouTube and subscribe that, uh, there if that's your choice, twit.tv slash TNW. And of course, you can be a part of the show if you'd like by sending us an email. It's tnw at twit.tv. And of course, follow us on social media. It's at twit on Twitter, at twit.tv on Instagram, at twit talk on TikTok. I'm at Micah Sargent on pretty much all of the social networks. And you can check out today's episode of Hands on iOS a little later today. I am talking about iMessage apps, games, and stickers. How do you get them? How do you reorganize them? How do you remove them? How do you use them? Everything you need to know about iMessage apps uh, will be hitting the scene later today. What about you, Jason? Nice. At Jason Howell on Twitter and Hands on Android just published right before showtime here, twit.tv slash HOA if you want to find out how to take some of the features. We don't know a whole lot about some of the marquee features of Android 11, but we know some of the features that will be there. So I thought, well, what about bringing those features over to Android 10? How can you do that with apps and stuff? So I take a look at that. Twit.tv slash HOA is where find uh, that episode. Uh, but that's it. Thanks to everyone who helped us do the show each and every week. John, of course, who also helps us with our hands-on shows. So John's very busy these days. As yes. well as Burke, who is usually uh, poking around the studio, helping out behind the scenes. And thanks to you for watching and listening to Tech News Weekly. We'll see you all next week. Bye, everybody. Goodbye, everyone. Ah. Goodbye to ah. you. Ah. Check out other shows here on Twit TV, including my show, Hands-On Photography. On this show, I'm going to show you how to get the most out of your camera as well as be a better post processor. So head on over to twit.tv hop and subscribe now.